It's my pleasure to introduce David Miklos, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Blood and Marrow Transplantation Division. Uh, he's going to be speaking on clinical impact of HY allo immunization. And I just want to say, I don't know if this is the same talk or a similar talk to one that I heard uh, when, he, when we had the immunology sex differences. And it was so fascinating that I decided we absolutely had to have it um, here. Plus, it's you know, it's we needed some why stuff too, so at <laughs> any rate, um, I'm just going to let him go. Today's his birthday, so I think we should all just quickly sing, happy birthday, no, no, happy no, no, birthday no. to you. <laughs> okay. We'll just stop with that. So he's embarrassed enough, and that's good. Um, and he's actually in, in a bit of a rush, so we're going to just let him take it away, and I will be giving you the five-minute sign when it's time to stop. Awesome. Well, thank you for the invitation again. I enjoyed it so much in 2014. I, I definitely wanted to take your invitation again, Mike. Thank you. So um, I'm in the bone marrow transplant division here at Stanford to give you a sense of um, uh, this is one of the preeminent programs in the country. And at Stanford, we'll perform 550 transplants this year. We anticipate there'll be 700 cell therapies in 2019. And to say it's a growing business with new uh, prospects of CAR T cell on the horizon is um, an understatement. But uh, I'm going to step back and I'm going to tell you about uh, when I was a PhD back in 1987. I was a geneticist with Mike at Yale, and he was actually on my committee. I don't know if he knows that anymore. Um, so uh, I was doing yeast genetics with a guy named Art Horwich, and uh, I finished up, went off to the Brigham, decided to do transplant, got to the lab, and uh, decided, what am I going to do? And uh, I said, I want to do some sort of an assessment of immune response after transplant. And I worked with a wonderful mentor, Jerry Ritz. And Jerry said, well, I think you should measure B cells, because everybody else in the world measured T cells. And I'll just say that made all the difference. So uh, today I'm going to tell you a really interesting story um, about uh, if you want to model immunity in human beings, you need to have a target. And uh, the story is very simple. It's a male uh, target uh, with uh, female immune responses, because the story continues. That year, uh, David Page published in 1998 the first of the human genome project, and the Y chromosome was laid out in nature. And you had to have something to say when you're in uh, nature publications, right? You can't just say, here's the sequence. So um, some of the studies I'll show you say that here are the targets of alloimmunity as been seen in transplantation uh, previously. And so I looked at that, and I said, OK, here it is. This is what we're going to do. And I spent the next 10 years on it. Um, so let's begin. Uh, I have to make some, yeah, you know, I do a lot of um, clinical and other research type of work now, so I have to say that today I will talk about rituximab and abrutinib, one of which is actually the only drug FDA approved for the treatment of uh, graft versus host disease, and it's work that stems right out of what I'm going to tell you about. So um, let's pay attention. This is good. All right, Irv Weissman's not in the room, but he's always in every room, right? So Irv Weissman <laughs> was chasing mice through uh, Boisman, Montana in 1957, and he was working with Eichwald and, and Silmer. And Irv is actually the senior author, although I don't think it meant the same thing in 1959, so 55. So uh, he was able to demonstrate with these guys that skin transplants of the male onto the female caused a, a rejection, and that the T cells that were transferred from those mice to the corresponding animal had elicited T cell responses. Okay, that was the beginning of sex mismatch as the animal model for transplantation. Uh, here's a very simple analysis of patients, males, going through transplantation who either had male brothers as their donor or females as their uh, sisters as their donors. And as evident, uh, if you had a female, you had more graft versus host disease. And the relative risk was a little bit greater if the female had been pregnant uh, numerous times. Nobody knew if those were males or females, but you know, it was a little bit greater. So right away, you see one thing, that is disparity is more important than parity. It sounds good even if it doesn't miss, register so well. Um, and you could carry this on with other studies. And you know, anytime you're looking at the combination of sex mass versus sex mismatch, there's a, there's a directionality to a transplant. And it's the female uh, lymphocytes landing in the male body, seeing Y chromosome for the first time, and has been either previously exposed during pregnancy, swapping spit, hair dander, who knows what the event was, but previously exposed and elicited immunity that can be recovered. Um, that recovery is both beneficial with less relapse after a sex mismatch transplant, but also detrimental because the same immune response that cures the patients can cause damage to skin, gut, liver, a process called graft versus host disease. 
And so this double-edged uh, knife is something that we kind of battle in transplantation all the time. And you could say, well, there's 25,000 other genes. Why don't you go get a new target? Why don't you find an important target? Why don't you go find a tumor, antigen-specific target? And I'm sure Mike could explain to you that uh, the numbers of uh, patients that would be required to find uh, meaningful codon polymorphisms between siblings that would then be measurable for clinical outcomes, impossible. It's a very small number. And, and so instead, what this provides is a model system to then ask the questions of, so what therapy is able to remove this immune response and provide better clinical outcomes? And so the short phrase, if anybody wants to do translational research, the short phrase is you have to find a leveraged patient population in which you can link the pharmacodynamic effect of what you're trying to accomplish with the clinical outcome. If you just go for, here's my question and here's the clinical outcome, the problems of death from infection, uh, problems of um, they never got to transplant, they developed uh, other complications, or the penetrance was not that great, will quickly limit your ability to study the problem. But if you have a pharmacodynamic assessment, that is, I have an immune response that I can measure carefully, and I can show that this drug makes that immune response go up or go down, and that links with the outcome, uh, you got gold, okay? And, and so that's the trick to successful uh, moving forward with uh, clinical trials. All right, I'm going to move kind of quickly. This is the joke slide. So yes, on the Y chromosome are all the things that I'm a specialist in, including uh, total lack of recall for dates, hearing loss, inability. You, you've seen these slides before. So the Y chromosome takes a bad rap, but uh, uh, I'm sure these slides will be on the um, website, and you're welcome to the joke. Um, it is true that when the uh, publications were occurring of the Human Genome Project that the association of these nine molecules that are now thought to be uh, expressed on the X and the Y with 95% identity, on the X chromosome they are not X inactivated, they're not lionized, so the dosage is the same in males and females, that the uh, features of these cells vary from essential components of the 40S ribosome down to uh, single zinc uh, finger uh, transcription factors with very low abundance. And all of these molecules have been shown, all nine of them, to elicit uh, T cell and, and now five of the nine B cell immune responses after either organ transplantation or uh, blood and marrow transplantation. So pretty powerful set of uh, studies, especially if you can build a, a, a way to measure this. And so it's not relevant what their functions are. They're varied. Uh, they're highly published. They're, the publications of what they do is highly published compared to what I measure their immune responses at. But you know that's, that's something I aspire towards in cell and nature. Um, and the uh, benefit of the sex mismatch clinical goes back into, as I showed, the mouse in 1955. Uh, the, few, the first of the human T cell immune responses measured on a Y chromosome protein by Els Gulmi, and uh, it continues every month in another journal somewhere around the country. So. Um, why B cells? Well, uh, B cells are not HLA restricted. They, again, allow you to monitor immune responses irrespective of the HLA restriction that uh, minor compatible antigens are needing in order to be seen by cognitive T cell responses, right? So the minor that's a piece of a cytosolic protein presented in scaffolding protein that we call MHC or HLA is a small nine amino acid piece that's seen by a highly polymorphic T cell receptor. The complexity and the repertoire of the T cell receptor we now know is about 10 to the 10th. Mark Davis did all the pioneering work. And if you look at the combination of a light chain, heavy chain with a polymorphic receptor, that combination is 10 to the 12th, and that's the Carl Sagan billions to the millions moment, which I'm sure geneticists say all the time. So it's infinitely complex. It has uh, an ability to be seen independent of HLA. It's uh, infinitely stable. You could leave these on your uh, bench top, but you don't have to do tissue culture. You don't have to work on the weekend. You don't have to feed the cells. And uh, why? what's not to like about this? And then the most important feature, and I didn't understand this for 10 years, is that a B cell response cannot go backwards. When you have a, a isotype switch, and that is the uh, B cell receptor, which sits on the surface of the, of the B cell itself, binds to an antigen, causes stimulation, causes the cell to now proliferate, expand, go to the lymph node, undergo T cell help, and that meaningful immune response is now going to take a piece of DNA out of its system and isotype switch. It can't go backwards, okay? That is a fixed B cell, it's committed, 
And every T cell is a polymorphic cell that changes phenotype every time I look at it. Okay, so it's very difficult to nail down whether or not that TH17 T cell is actually central effector memory or something else. But an isotype switch antibody response means that it was a T cell helped meaningful immune response that occurred in a lymph node. It wasn't by chance, okay? So there's a lot of reasons to measure antibodies. And then you can do it relatively quickly. We had uh, ELISA's in 2004, and then we developed a platform with uh, microarrays that we were able to collect blood samples for uh, 10 plus years uh, at... Uh, 30, 60, 90, 120, um, 10 time points out through uh, t uh, three years after transplant on over uh, 1,500 patients going through transplant. And so finally, in 2015, having been here for over 10 years, this will kill your career, by the way. Uh, after being here for over 10 years, we were able to write the kind of more definitive paper by doing this uh, high throughput analysis using uh, protein microarrays, measuring reproducible uh, antibody detection and uh, quantifying it, as I say, for six different antigens and nine different time points and adding it up and, you know, getting some statisticians involved. And it became relatively simple to make a score. And on this score, every antigen immune response became equivalent. And so we could follow an HY score over time for individual antigens, or we could just simply do a um, collection where uh, an antibody response to any one antigen added up, and these were all univariate uh, responses. Um, what did it matter? Well, so people who made these antibody responses developed this problem called chronic graft-versus-host disease. And it's not a small problem. This is why everybody doesn't want an allo transplant. Uh, the immune response that is benefiting you, killing the cancer, is uh, oftentimes, 50% of the time, causing changes that you see here. So you can see the hyperpigmentation. You can see that the skin is actually drum tight, often described as hide bound. You can see that uh, the patients are going to have reduced uh, ability to range of motion. They're going to have problems with their eyes, their mouth. They're going to have all kinds of connective tissue disorders that you would have described as lupus, autoimmunity, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and scleroderma. And they're really unpredictable. And all we know is that uh, and this is a slide of 10 years ago, is that it responds to steroids and we don't understand the etiology. Well, so seeing this correlation of antibody development at the time of development of chronic GVHD said, hey, it might be B cells. And then being able to move forward and uh, quantify different trials with our new tool and measure the male with the females. Now, that's a huge limitation, right? You can only study one-fourth of the patients on your trial with that pharmacodynamic assessment. You can't study the matched ones. You can't study the other ones. Uh, so that was a big limitation, but you didn't have to actually study everybody on the, on the trial. You were happy to have that pharmacodynamic effect associating with the clinical outcome of at least uh, one or two. And what was really interesting in this analysis is that we could see at three months the development of these antibodies that were not present at two months that were predicting what was going to happen on average nine months after the transplant, six months before something happens. And so it adds a, a whole level of, I know it's coming. I know who my high-risk patients are. We have to watch these guys closely. And um, this allowed us to then show that the same effects were present at a year after transplant. And so what started as a simple observation of antibodies in patients who developed chronic GVHD, we were then able to do temporal association, and then we're able to actually move from the antibody to the ability to detect the antigen-specific response on individual B cells by a fax analysis working with Lee and Len Herzenberg, and really the star of my lab, Bita Sahaf, who stays with me now 12 plus years and is the maven of all immunophenotyping. So if you can imagine, these are cells that are um, like a tetramer analysis specific for a small little peptide called DBY2, it's nine amino acids, and we can uh, track those cells. We've sequenced those cell immune receptors showing that, you know, these are clonal response. You can tell that this is a clonal response. And then you can watch for editing changes. So pretty interesting. And you can say that if you give a drug like rituximab, which was already FDA approved in 1998 and can clear 99.9% .9 of B cells, and that sounds like a lot, except that in every one milliliter of blood, there's over uh, 100,000 B cells, and 10 mils of blood, there's a million. And if you only dropped it three logs, you still have 10,000, and they're always the most allo-reactive stimulated B cells. So they like to stick around. But we showed in early rituximab that we could mitigate the effect, although those same cells would come back over time. What it did do, though, is it brought us to a drug called abrutinib. So abrutinib is... Um, Oh, so, yeah, so if you treat with rituximab, the same stupid B cells that are DBY antibody antigen specific with the same receptor sequences come back again six to 12 months after you treat. 
there was actually nothing specific about rituximab for a proliferating cell. And you also ablated the entire immune response, not just the ones that were activated at the time, because it's just on the surface of the B cells. It's not targeting the cells that are stimulated at the time of the immunological damage. So uh, abrutinib, uh, back to our friend, is a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And the same gentleman that uh, worked in Ron Levy's lab and was involved in the discovery of rituximab at a company called IDEC Biogen, uh, Rich Miller. Uh, and uh, Rich Miller also worked at uh, Pharmacyclics when he uh, said we should study this drug. It binds into the um, Burton tyrosine kinase uh, activation site. It covalently links through a cysteine residue, and it prevents the phosphorylation that's necessary for the activation signaling cascade from antigen binding to a B cell receptor to the activation of, T of B cell proliferation. This is the therapy that is now used in the treatment of uh, FDA approved for CLL, marginal zone lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And that's 60, 70,000 patients a year taking a therapy, and I will say it's an expensive one, uh, that is, um, this has replaced essentially rituximab. Now, um, what is more exciting, and it goes beyond the scope of what we're going to show today, is that it also has a homologue of uh, the BTK molecule in T cells that it's called IL-2 inducible tyrosine kinase. And the lymphocytes are somehow evolutionary uh, related. That'd be a fascinating discussion for a bunch of geneticists. And so the same packing, the same uh, cysteine residue is conserved. And if you uh, look in the T cells through mechanisms like uh, Multitoff or Cytoff, that you can show the inhibition of particular populations of T cells. And so you end up preserving cytotoxic T cells while you ablate those cells that are tolerizing and are driving the helper T cell function that are CD4 positive and Th2 in nature. It's fascinating, right? This is an immune modulating drug that's being used as a therapy for a cancer, but uh, now being added to CAR T cells, immune therapies around the world, and uh, I'm not allowed to buy this stock. I don't, uh, I don't plan to as an investigator, but boy, this thing is just starting to find its utility, okay? It's uh, far more than a B cell killer. And so um, we led the 42 patient phase two study using this drug in people who had steroid refractory chronic GVHD, and it was a home run. 67% response rates, patients coming off all drugs. And uh, that led to the FDA approving this medicine on a breakthrough designation in August of last year. And so that allows patients around the world to now get access to a medicine which otherwise is prohibitively expensive and unavailable to them. Um, in order to prove that this is really as good as we say, we're doing a randomized controlled trial, placebo-blinded with over 300 patients, and, you know, truth will come out. And because phase two studies are always lack to, to bias. Okay. I have five minutes, and I'm going to tell the, uh, the last part of the story. So you can see, uh, my point of this presentation is genetic modeling uh, can be very simple, right? I mean, Y chromosome. And uh, I didn't have to genotype. And uh, there are uh, polymorphisms in those molecules. And if you look at the sex match, there are sometimes responses, and that's probably related to the non-gender specific polymorphisms. But um, are there other impacts of this once you start to look? And yes, Henriette uh, uh, Nielsen is a colleague from Copenhagen, and she came to me and said, there's this problem with pregnancies, and many women have pregnancy loss. And you all know that that's often related to unrecognized or recognized chromosomal damage. And that might be functional, but often we think it's immunological. And there's a situation where um, gender uh, of the firstborn children in the family can predict for what's going to happen subsequently. And so what we call secondary uh, pregnancy loss or recurrent miscarriages either follow from situations where um, there was no uh, primary normal live birth, or there was a secondary miscarriage event that followed the birth of a, of a healthy individual, okay? And so they track these things. I mean, who knew? But they track these things in registries. And if you have a firstborn boy, you are more than 74% likely. So if you have secondary miscarriages, you have an 80% chance that the firstborn was a male. If you had a male firstborn, the, the chance that the children that follow are younger or smaller birth weight is higher. And it, you know, really kind of screamed that there was some sort of an immunological sensitization to the female, and obviously HY would be an obvious thing to look for. So um, we looked together, and we took, uh, I think it was 75 males with females. I'm going to just get to the data slide because I'm out of time. And uh, we asked uh, if you looked at patients, uh, males with female, uh, sorry, women who had secondary miscarriages, 
versus those who had primary miscarriages versus normal healthy women. Is there a difference in our detection of HY antibodies? And of course there is. Um, I'm gonna carry that one step further. I was just contacted by a bunch of uh, really interesting Italians. Uh, they uh, carried this on. I've moved on to other topics that I'm interested in in my laboratory. And uh, there's a JAMA paper from last year that shows that if you have blood transfusions uh, that derive from a multiparous female blood donor, you had an 8% chance of um, bad outcomes. And you have a hazard ratio of 0.8 of death after getting blood from multiparous women. So um, they've given me a set of 1,000 serum to measure blindly, and we're going to do that. And you know we'll never get a grant for that, but we'll do that. And we'll send them the data back, and uh, we'll see what that shows. Um, again, uh, the point was not to say I figured out anything genetically. I'm still a male with a Y chromosome, and yes, I'm red-green colorblind. But, uh, but there's a model that is pretty simple that um, is important in immunology. And you know, immunology and the immune responses are things that drive medicine. And uh, it's been estimated 90% of medicine is, is inflammation and immune responses. So uh, kind of important. I, I like to keep an eye on the Y chromosome. I'm going to stop, and I'll take any questions. And uh, I'll simply say that there was statistical significance. And we think that. Um, why chromosomes uh, have allowed us to find those important pharmacodynamic immune responses. I don't know what you guys do with your Y chromosomes, but uh, I would I'd keep looking. Thank you.